So just to get started, my name is Mary Claire. I'm a communication ambassador here at the Office for Sustainability, and I've been helping to put um, this workshop series together. So thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you for um, coming together with us virtually. This is obviously different than in years past, um, but we're still going to learn a lot, and it's going to be great. So the workshop today is going to be put on by Crystal. Uh, so Crystal here is a project coordinator out of our Gibbs site. That is the farm that we oversee. That's where we do our composting. Um, she'll go into more of that later on. Um, she is a PhD student studying electrical engineering. She has been working here since 2018, and she has been helping with our composting efforts since around January of 2019. So this is something that she has been working on for quite some time now, and she's gonna share all of the knowledge with you guys today. So it's gonna be awesome, super exciting. Um, feel free to keep your cameras on if you'd like. Just please stay muted throughout the entire presentation. Um, if you have any questions throughout, you can go ahead, you can put those in the chat, or Krista will open it up for questions um, at two different points during this workshop. So there will be time for those questions. Um, in the meantime, if you are a student, I'm just going ahead and putting a link in the chat. So this link is for signature credit. Um, again, that's just only for students, but click on that link. You can sign in there. Um, the next thing I just want to mention is we have lots of workshops that are still coming up throughout the semester. Uh, most of those will be virtual. There are two that are in person that are going to be socially distant. So if you're interested in those, you can visit our website. I'll put the link in the chat real quickly. Um, but then also, if you want to learn about those events or just other things going on here at the office, we do have a newsletter and that will be going out once a month and that will actually be going out this week. So I'm just gonna go ahead and put that link in the chat. But yeah, if you just wanna stay up to date with everything here at the Office for Sustainability, go ahead, fill that out. Um, but other than that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Crystal. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Crystal. Uh, like Mary Claire said, um, I worked here, I've been working here at the office since 2018. Um, and I mostly work out at the Gibbs uh, house site. The Gibbs site, I'll be talking about and, and like referencing a lot throughout this um, presentation because that's where all of our composting efforts are at. Um, the Gibbs house, if you don't know, it's um, kind of close to uh, the engineering college. It's ba basically in its backyard, um, but it's off of Parkview in between Oakland and Drake. Um, and we hold volunteer hours over there and um, other small events when, I mean, maybe larger events, but not during COVID. Um, but yeah, if you ever want to volunteer out there, there's um, hands-on composting things that you can do. Um, so you can put what you learn here into work. Um, so just like some composting history at the office, um, basically, we've been doing composting projects since the inception of the Office for Sustainability. Um, there was a couple like class projects and starting in 2008 that would um, that would like study about reducing food waste in the dining hall and then um, various dining halls around campus. And then um, we've also done various studies like uh, vermicomposting, which involves worms. Um, black soldier fly larvae, um, which um, involves black soldier fly larvae composting. Um, so, and I'll go over a little bit of this stuff. We no longer do the black soldier fly, but we do vermicomposting, which is worms. Um, and then, uh, so we still have some of those bins, which I'll go over. And then um, other projects, we like um, promoting research here at the office. So any anytime someone has a research idea, usually try to dive right into it. Um, yeah, so I'll go into um, the presentation I have prepared now. Uh, here we go, share my screen. Uh, cool, here we go. Yeah, you can see it, right? Okay, cool. So yeah, um, so WMU composting. This is a, the picture is actually, composting sticker we have and if you wanted it you can drop by the office and get some stickers um they're kind of fun uh but anyways uh so what is composting composting is the 
aerobic decomposition of organic materials by microorganisms, and it'll turn into natural fertilizer. Uh, so aerobic means it requires oxygen. Um, a lot of the small microorganisms require oxygen to work and live and thrive. Um, and so usually when you're composting, you want to incorporate some um, aeration process. Sometimes that just involves mixing it up. Um, and if you're composting with worms, usually the worms, it just moving around um, is enough to aerate it. So that's what aerobic decomposition means involving oxygen. Um, however, like as organisms are working in there, uh, they deplete the supply of oxygen. So like I said, you need to have some sort of mixing or aeration process. Um, so yeah, if you're composting and it's emitting some bad odor, um, usually it's too wet and you could mix it up or add more paper product to it. And that will um, be able to um, decrease the bad smell. Um, yeah, so composting has tons of benefits like I listed here. And I'll be going through each of those benefits a little bit in more detail as we go through this presentation. Uh, but first I'm gonna talk about what you can compost. So you can compost um, all, basically all fruits and vegetables. Um, sometimes um, pits like the avocado pits uh, don't break down very um, easily. So sometimes I just throw those away since they take a long time to break down. Um, but yeah, you can compost most organic materials. The most common food waste to compost, like I said, fruits and veggies, as well as tea leaves, coffee grounds, coffee filters, egg and nut shells. Uh, but you can compost more than just what comes out of your kitchen. You can compost things from your backyard if you have a yard, such as grass clippings, bark, leaves, fallen branches. Uh, they can all be thrown in the compost pile as well. Uh, pretty much any paper product can easily break down in that compost pile too. So paper towels, cardboard, stuff like that. Um, the last common item that can be composted is certain types of manure, uh, which sounds kind of gross, but many farmers uh, that have barnyard animals compost the manure that they have from those animals and use it on their crops. Um, but that's kind of like a more advanced um, thing that I've never done. So that's as much as I'll probably go over the manure composting today, um, because you have to be very careful when you're composting um, manure because of potential health risks. So what can't you compost? Some of the big no-nos for a composting bin are glass, metal, and plastics. Uh, you just have to throw those away or recycle them. And um, we call those contaminants in a composting um, bin. If you include those in a composting bin, it, it usually like you would just have to throw it out from there because especially plastic, when it breaks down into little microplastics, um, it gets everywhere and it's hard to separate. So want to keep out those contaminants. Um, and even though um, a lot of fruit has those stickers, like a banana peel has usually stickers and you're going to want to peel those stickers off of the banana peel. Um, but anyways, uh, so uh, also there's bones. Um, you will want to, any bones, um, it's technically like okay if they're in there, but they're not gonna break down because bones take a long, long time to break down. Um, so yeah, and the next things you don't wanna add are pet droppings from animals such as cats and dogs. Uh, those are very likely to carry pathogens and diseased plants could also um, carry an infection into your compost. Now, there are also things that are just more difficult to compost, like meats, dairies, fats, and oils. It'll make your compost smell super bad, so I would just stick to not throwing any of those in there. And then weeds are a common thing that you throw in like outdoor composting if you're like weeding and stuff. Um, but some people suggest not to throw those in there because weed seeds will get into your final compost product and then um, they will then, if you spread them out on your garden, then they will be in your garden. Um, so there is a way to avoid that though. If you if your pile gets warm enough above about 140 degrees Fahrenheit, that'll make almost all the weed seeds inert. So 
it won't be a problem, but generally I would say a lot of weeds um, don't go in a compost bin. So recipe building, um, sounds like we're cooking something, but um, what we're cooking is compost. Uh, so a lot of um, recipes you will hear refer to the carbon to nitrogen ratios. Um, that's just referring to um, composting things that have a large amount of carbon in them, like leaves, paper, uh, bark, trees, um, stuff are heavy in car carbon. And things that are more heavy in nitrogen are like the manure, the food scraps, the veggies, the grass, fruit. So those are heavy in nitrogen. And so like the nitrogen products, the greens also have carbon, but they have a lot less. And so all these carbon to nitrogen ratios can be a bit confusing, um, but there's a much easier way to think about it. Usually you can just dump in one bucket of a carbon source, paper, leaves, and then one bucket of a nitrogen source, fruits, veggies. Um, so if you are noticing that maybe you're, you're doing this one-to-one -one ratio, and it's de decomposing a little bit too slowly, that probably means you have too much of the carbon and you'll wanna add a little bit more of a nitrogen, a fruit, veggie, the green source. And if your pile is too smelly and it's really maybe too wet, you probably want to add more carbon, some more paper. And so like, it's just a balancing act, but if you wanna be like a little bit more exact, um, you can go to that link, which I can put in the comments um, later uh, in, the, in the chat box. Um, that'll help you calculate your, um, your ratio of carbon to, to nitrogen. It's much more exact. It'll ask you like what exactly you're feeding and then it'll give you a rough estimate of how much you should put in there. Um, but usually a general thing that I go with is one bucket of carbon, one bucket of nitrogen, and you're usually good with that. Um, so yeah, once you, once it's a perfect ratio, your micro and macro organisms will thrive. Um, so you start with the smaller microorganisms, bacteria, fungi, and then you move on to the bigger ones. Like I was saying, there's um, worms commonly in a compost pile. We find them even when we don't add them to a compost pile, they just end up in there anyways. Um, but sometimes people do what they call vermicomposting, and that's when you're purposely feeding, you have a bucket of worms and you're feeding the worms um, the food. And I'll go over that a little bit more later. Um, so feedstock preparation. There are two types that you can have. You can have a batch compost pile, or um, next I'm going to be talking about a feed as you go pile. So a batch compost is what like large companies that are doing compost do. They, you have to stockpile enough browns and greens to make the compost pile big enough. Um, this technique's useful because, um, because of the larger volume, it actually keeps everything warmer and insulated and um, it breaks down faster because when your pile's warmer, it breaks down a little faster. Um, yeah, but this is problem. This is usually a problem for um, individual, just like doing it at your doing it by yourself at your home composting projects. So normally, I like to talk about um, at as you go piles, which are the vermicomposting I've been talking about. All you have to do with vermicomposting is add wetted shredded paper. So you want to wet it for the worms. Um, and then you just add the worms and you can choose any bin. I chose a store-bought bin from Lowe's and they're fine in there. Um, you'll see that in a video later on. Um, but yeah, so all you have to do is bury the food scraps slowly but surely. And um, usually I just bury like two handfuls per pound of worms um, and then they eat it and it doesn't really smell that badly. I mean, it doesn't really smell at all. I've had a compost bin on a, um, a table that I've ate at before and it's fine. Um, yeah, so I would suggest vermicomposting for indoor, um, indoor composting methods. Like I've done it at my apartment before. Um, it's all good. And then there's other like smaller add-as-you-go piles that you can do. You can do it with 
um, store bought bins. Um, you can buy bins online, just add as you go, add paper, add an equal amount of food scraps. Um, this is only a little bit, um, it just, de the only major con is it decomposes kind of slowly. Um, it doesn't heat up well either. So like I said, when piles don't heat up, they don't kill any like weed seeds. So you wouldn't want to add weeds to the, these add as you go pile. Um, yeah, and as long as you keep um, enough paper um, compared to the food, it shouldn't smell. So yeah. Um, so tips for any pile, moisture level is important. Um, you don't want it too moist, but especially if you're dealing with worms, you want it moist enough where um, they can enjoy their life. Basically, they like it moist in there. Um, but only like if you were to squeeze the compost, only one to two drops is usually the check um, you have. And then there's some optional things. Um, there are activators that you can buy online, uh, compost starters. These are for like outdoor bins. If you were, these just have like bact bacteria and fungi already in them and it kind of starts your pile right up really fast. Um, they're not necessary. I've never used any, um, but yeah, they're out there. Um, covering your pile will, if you're having a problem with it drying out, covering it will already, already will keep the moisture and heat inside and animals out. So if you have an outdoor bin, you probably want it covered. Um, yeah. And then checking temperatures every once in a while if you have a thermometer, but that's not necessary either. Uh, next. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the benefits. Uh, one of the benefits is enriching soil. So soil um, is depleted a lot um, and the nutrients are sucked out of it, especially with like um, large farming practices. Um, and when you add compost to any of these soils, it adds nutrients back to it. It also prevents erosion, um, helps the soils maintain moisture and basically it just like keeps carbon into the ground as well. It's a good like carbon sequestration um, type practice. It's pretty cool. Um, saves landfill space. This is um, more like obvious, uh, um, but yeah, if you don't throw your food away, it's not going to the landfill. Um, about 50%, about half of the garbage we throw away in America is food. Um, or is compostable products, 21% about food, um, and then the rest, yard and wood and paper products. So yeah, let's keep that out of the landfill. Um, decreases greenhouse gases. Like I said, it sequesters carbon, which is pretty interesting. And um, it keeps also methane. It decreases the amount of methane in the air as well. Um, improves water quality. Um, it immobilizes and degrades pollutants, which sounds weird, but basically um, it improves the water quality because it acts as a filter and a sponge and immobilizing and degrades pollutants means, um, it means that it like uh, keeps them in the ground and doesn't like make them go into the plants, which it's a complicated process, but um, basically, there, there's a way that it breaks up the pollutants, mostly because um, the microorganisms break them up themselves. Um, so certain microorganisms, bacteria and fungi, degrade the pollutants and inoculate compounds such as carbon dioxide and water. So basically it makes the compounds, like splits them up. It's a complicated chemistry stuff, but it's pretty cool. Um, and then creates jobs, uh, composting, uh, involves a lot of people and it can be a lot of work. So composting can create jobs. It's pretty, pretty cool. Um, so there, I'm going to go over a couple composting methods. I talked a lot about vermicomposting um, already, but I will show it um, an actual vermicomposting bin and other bins as well that we have around, um, around the Gibbs house. So we have always really had a static pile. This is where we just throw um, like grass if we cut the lawn and you could throw food in there too. Um, it collects a lot of our yard waste and um, we have a three bin set up. So you see the one bin closer to us and behind it, there's three more bins. So as soon as one is filled, we move on to the next one. 
Um, yeah, so that's a basic just add as you go pile. Just whenever we have waste, we put it in there. Um, yeah. Outdoor hoop house vermicomposting bin. Um, you'll also see this in our video, but this bin was made when we made a hoop house. So hoop house is like a greenhouse, but made of plastic instead of like glass stuff. Um, and um, in 2019, we, uh, we gathered about 38, oh, 152 pounds of compost from this. So that went on a lot of our plants around the Gibbs house. Um, and we also offered them to students and staff. So sometimes we give away our compost. Um, yeah, just a nice uh, vermicompost and it's in the ground to keep the worms warm even during the winter. Um, so we also have an indoor vermicomposting bin. Like I said, just add um, shredded paper, moist the shredded paper, add food scraps, add the worms, and they're happy in there. Um, we have what we call lasagna beds. So these are a little different. We just put, um, they're called lasagna because they're like different layers of composting material. We'll add hay and then grass clippings and then go from there. Um, and they're in our food forest. So this is great because if you have a raised bed, you can put your food waste or like um, dead plant plants that have died in your um, raised beds and then let them break down over the winter. And then you'll have dirt already in those spots. Um, and you don't have to move dirt around as much because the, the yard waste will compost in those places and you'll already have dirt there. Um, yeah. And then we have a bunch of store-bought bins, which I will go over in the video that we have pre-recorded. Um, but yeah, if you go online, you could search for these bins. And if you're interested in one, I can find a link um, for you where you can buy them. Um, yeah. And then the my major project right now is an aerated static pile. Um, so I talked about how you, you should try to aerate your bin. And a lot of these bins over here are tumbling bins. So they go in a circle. And so it's pretty easy to aerate them because you just spin them. Um, when you have large static piles, that you, a lot of people try to mix them with a windrow turner or like big machinery. And those are expensive. So a cheaper way to do it is add PVC pipes underneath the pile and then pump air in underneath the pile and then it aerates um, the pile enough and it's pretty cool. Um, the aerators you buy are the same as like, um, as you would buy for like a bouncy house. Um, yeah, so it's pretty cool. And I'm we're actually building this, this week we're building a large, um, wooden structure for it. And I'll show some pictures. So we did some versions of it to test out how it would work. So I built one with this smaller white plastic bin. Um, and then I built a bin with a um, biology student, a biology grad student did de different soil tests and compared an aerated static pile to regular static piles where we didn't do any mixing. Um, the results aren't really back for that yet, but I'm excited to see them. Um, and then I'm building this tomorrow, actually. Uh, it's pretty cool. Um, so these four um, bins right here are going to be all made of wood. We're going to power the aerator off of a solar panel, and we're going to check the temperature and moisture with um, wireless sensors. So it'll be cool. Um, and we have a lot of collaborators, and we work with a lot of people. All of the food scraps we get, well, most of them we get are from the Valley Dining Center. And after I make that aerated large static pile, we'll be able to compost everything from one of the dining centers on campus. Um, yeah, and then we work with the biology department a lot. Um, there's been a undergrad class um, that tested our soil for us in um, separate piles that we've worked with. And then um, we used to have a Bronco Buckets program, uh, but that ended when COVID happened. But um, we could always, we could bring it back if there's enough interest after COVID maybe. Um, yeah. And then overall goals are to provide a learning space to collaborate with the landscape, the dining centers, everyone around campus, decrease WMU's carbon footprint and help the environment. Um, so yeah. 
And then there's just a couple lists that you can, stuff that you can do. The most obvious one is composting at home and making your own bin. You can also volunteer. I looked up some volunteer places online. I just typed in into Google Kalamazoo volunteering, uh, composting. And there was a couple things that popped up. Um, there's a vine composting um, area. There's a Kalamazoo Community Foundation. Kalamazoo Nature Center has done some stuff. But yeah, you could also just come to the Gibbs house and join me for composting. Uh, yeah. And then finally, here is just a basic rundown of what we're doing at the office. I know Mary Claire went over that a little bit in the beginning. Um, and I can include these links in the chat afterwards. Um, yeah, for our upcoming workshops, we have a, two biking ones that are in person. And then the local sustainability and the beeswax wraps are both online like this. Yeah. And I think that's, that is all. So now... Um, I could open it up for a few questions. If you have any questions, I know I went through a lot of stuff really fast, um, but you can ask me questions if you have any. You could do the like raising the hand, you could type it in the chat if you want, um, or we can, or if you wanna think about a question you may have, um, you can do it at the end. There's one about, 10, 12 minute video we have. Um, so the easiest way for a beginner to start, I would say is, I always suggest the vermicomposting, even though some people are afraid or like creeped out by worms, um, you get used to it. Um, but it is easier if you have a backyard too, or a garage, you could put the worms in your garage. But the backyard. Um, you could just buy one of these store-bought bins I talked about and just start feeding those bins. And then a lot of them are tumbling. All you have to do is turn them and um, that'll, um, that's the easiest way to start really. Um, I'm going to go over all the separate bins and um, in the video that I'm about to show. And it kind of shows you the step-by-step -step happening in person. Um, yeah, what kind of container do you recommend for beginner? Uh, yeah, so I would say, like I said, vermicomposting is super easy and super convenient because the worms just do it for you. Um, there are store-bought vermicomposting bins that make it even easier. Um, and then there's also like the store-bought bins, like I said, is the easiest way. Or you could just, if you have a backyard, you could just make it uh, a wooden box and just feed it in there. Um, all you have to do is you adding water, adding food scraps, adding a carbon source, and that's it. Um, heating up process confuses me. What, what if mine doesn't heat up? So it doesn't have to heat up. Um, usually the larger composting like Industries have to make sure a certain temperature is hit, um, but it's not the most important thing. Um, yeah, so in the winter, it is hard. I'm gonna be talking about in the video a little bit of what you can do to combat our cold Michigan temperatures. Um, but basically there's different um, ways you can make sure it stays warm enough to keep composting. Um, Warming up just speeds it up. It doesn't mean you can't compost if you can't get your pile warm enough. Uh, warming it up just speeds it up. And how you warm it up is insulating it well. If it's outside, you can put hay barrels around it um, and then making the pile as big as possible. Would a bucket work to begin with? Yeah, you could just, some people just have a bucket and they put it in there, um, food scraps, wood, chips, whatever, and it composts in this bucket. I would like mix the bucket around to keep the air going. Um, do you oh. use worms in the bins, that roll? Um, I don't, but you can. You can put worms in the bins that roll. I mean, I've seen people have um, worms in those bins, yes. Oh, excuse me, Crystal. Yes. Sorry, there was just a question up above. Um, it said, are empty toilet paper, paper towel, cardboard rolls okay to go in the compost tumbler? 
Yes, they are. I would moisten them, um, wet them, but yeah, they can go in the cardboard. I would also tear them up a little bit. Um, anything you cut or paper you shred up will compost faster. Um, yes, a bu bucket would work to begin with. How long does a bin take to break down? Um, so it depends on the bin. If you're if you can't get it warm enough, it could take um, four um, months depending on the season. Um, a vermicomposting bin um, depends how many worms you have, but you, usually I let it go for four months and they just do their thing. Um, four months is a good estimate, um, but if you are building large piles and in the summer, it usually only takes a month to two months to break all of that down. Um, are human hair and nail clippings okay? Uh, some people do put those in there um they take a longer time to break down though um yeah so i don't put them in there just because i'm trying to get a lot of composting product product out fast but they take a longer time to break down um so yeah uh i answer that white paper cereal boxes so i have done um white paper white paper is fine i shut it up it's fine in there and the, the worms eat through it. And so, and they're okay. Um, yeah, white paper is okay. I've done that. And then cereal boxes it probably depends. The I've tried to compost stuff with that waxy outer layer. Um, it's okay. I, I wouldn't suggest it though. Um, you mentioned shredded paper. Is shredded printer paper okay? Yes, that's normally what I put in... Um, in uh, the vermicomposting bins with the worms. So yes, shredded paper, printer paper is okay. Um, yeah, I hope I answered all your questions. The heating up process is confusing and I do go over in the video a little bit how you could keep your piles a little warmer in the summer. It's pretty easy. Sometimes they get too warm when they're outside, um, but um, there's ways to insulate it with hay barrels or just other leaves around it. Um, the bigger pile, the warmer it's gonna get. But if your pile freezes, it's fine. You can check back in the spring and it should um, get closer to, it, it's not gonna ruin your compost if it freezes. Um, it just takes longer. You've heard some people dump their vacuum cleaner bags into the compost pile. What are your thoughts on that? I've never done it. Uh, <laughs> I actually haven't heard of that before, but I could look into it. I'm sure it would be okay, but if you're vacuuming up some, there's a lot of like, I mean, microplastics are everywhere, so they're gonna end up in your compost pile the hardest, even if you try your darndest, um, normally they end up in there. Um, but I could see if you add vacuum cleaner bags to it, you could potentially even introduce some contaminants in there. Um, yeah, that is it. Any other last minute questions? We have a video Mary Claire is going to play for us. Cool. It'll basically just be showing you um, the bins and me mm -hmm. actually going through the composting process of dumping food scraps and paper products in there. Um, yeah. And I'll add some links as that video is going. Perfect, thank you, Crystal, so much. So yep, I'll go ahead, I'll get that video started. Um, if anyone has any issues with seeing or hearing that video, please just put it in the chat and I'll try to like problem solve that. Um, I forgot to mention at the beginning though, this is recorded. So this video along with Crystal's presentation and all the questions that are being answered will be included and sent out to you. So yeah, we'll go ahead and get started with that video and then we'll have time for more questions at the end. So now that we have some fruit or veggie scraps, what else do we need? Well, our fruit and veggies are known as our green source or our nitrogen source. And so we need about an equal amount of browns or a carbon source. That can be wood chips, hay, leaves, 
paper, shredded paper, uh, cardboard, anything like that. Um, so today we have one bucket of wood chips. So that's what we'll be using. So now that we have our nitrogen source and our carbon source, what else do we need? Well, we need a place to put them. And today we're going to be putting them in to this bin, this tumbling bin. Um, this bin was made by our staff members at the Gibbs site. Um, we got this 55 gallon bin donated to us and then our wood shop built the frame around it. Uh, so it's known as a tumbling bin and that just means that we're able to turn the bin to introduce oxygen into the system more easily. Um, so like I was saying before, oxygen needs to be added into the composting process to keep the microbes and the bacteria and all the good fungi alive uh, to break down our food scraps. So we will be using this bin right now, but uh, don't worry, I'll be showing you other bins that we have around at the gift site. First, we dump in our bucket of food scraps, fruits, and veggies. And then we dump in our carbon source, or we're using wood chips. Now, you may be thinking, is it really that easy? Is that all I have to do? Well, kind of. It kind of depends on what type of bin you have or what type of year it is. For example, like during Michigan's uh, cold, dry winters, you may want to add um, a bucket of water. A lot of people do suggest dampening your carbon source before you add it. Um, so I would just fill up water on the carbon source as much as possible. Um, that can help. Or what you could do is add maybe an extra amount of carbon source. Um, usually you want to choose, if you're doing this, you want to choose a carbon source that's easier to break down. For example, leaves, leaves break down pretty easily. So you could add one bucket of your fruit or veggies to two buckets of damp leaves. Probably want to dampen them before you put, it, put them in there. Uh, but sometimes, no matter what you do, keeping your pile warm enough um, will be somewhat out of your control. Um, sometimes it's too cold and it will freeze, uh, but don't worry, uh, it'll defrost as the uh, weather gets warmer and then your compost will be fine uh, once it starts breaking down a little bit more again. You could try to make um, your pile as big as possible to keep it very warm. The bigger the pile, the warmer it will stay. Obviously, if you have a, a store-bought bin or a bin like this, you're kind of constricted to the size, but there's other bins you can do uh, that you can make it as big as possible. Like if you make your own out of wood, you can make it really big. Um, and then lastly, you can insulate it with uh, stuff like hay barrels around your bin. That'll be hard with this tumbler since it's in the air, but there's other store-bought bins that are on the ground and you can surround them by hay barrels and that'll keep it insulated as well. So another type of composting that we do here at the Gibbs site is vermicomposting. Vermicomposting is just composting with worms involved. Uh, so all you need is a bin. We have our outdoor bin, which is this, or we also have an indoor bin like this one. Uh, so you need a bin a carbon source just like before we usually use shredded paper wetted shredded paper because that's what uh, the worms kind of like they also don't mind like other things like hay uh, but usually we use shredded paper you wet it because they want a moist environment and then you add um, food scraps you just bury them burying the food scraps is usually the best way to do that and then you add the worms uh, so we have been um, having this outdoor uh, vermicomposting bin since we built the hoop house. Um, it's been in here and it's dug kind of into the ground and we insulated it over the winter and the worms stay alive all winter long. Um, the indoor vermicomposting bin is like this. You can choose any bin that you prefer and um, all you need to do, like I said, wet 
the shredded paper, add food, add blurbs. And you kind of get the hang of it after a while, but this is what I normally suggest people if they have um, an apartment. Um, that's what I normally suggest people to use if they want to do an indoor bin. I know it sounds weird to have worms in your apartment, um, but I've done it and it's fine. Um, if you control the amount of food that you put in there, it doesn't really, it doesn't smell. It does not. Um, you add too much food, it will start to smell, but you get kind of the balance in there. Usually you just need like a handful of food scraps uh, a week, maybe twice a week, depending on how many worms you put in there. Normally people buy about a pound of worms. Another option for vermicomposting is a store-bought, online-bought vermicomposting bin. This one's called um, a worm factory, and what you do is you add uh, the food scraps, uh, wetted paper, worms to the bottom layer, and then uh, you let them do their thing in there, and then you start adding food scraps to the second layer, and then eventually since you're not adding food scraps to the first layer anymore, the worms will make their way up to the second layer. And then the bottom layer will just have your uh, vermi compost uh, left over. So you'll just have your nice compost left in the bottom layer. And all your worms will already be separated into, and they will be in the second layer. Then you work your way up from there. And if there's any extra moisture, you can empty it with this little spout. Uh, I normally don't suggest the store-bought bins just because they're more expensive and you can just use a bin you, you may already have at home, but it is an easy way to do it and they have nice directions on the lid. So we have two more of our store-bought bins right here, this pink one and this green one. So this pink one is another tumbling bin, you just roll it like, like this kind of heavy right now, we just added a lot of food scraps. Um, but this one's perfect if you don't have a lot of food waste, if you're just like a couple people at home and you want those to have this outside, because it's pretty small. Um, so that's perfect for that. Same thing, add a bucket of food, a bucket of carbon. It's probably perfect for you. Um, this one is perfect for you if you're not so worried about the final compost that you want at the end, if you don't need that final soil. And if you're just looking for a place to uh, dump your food waste so you don't have to dump it in the trash, this one's perfect. Um, because it goes into the soil that surrounds it, it's dug into the ground. Uh, so if you wanted that final compost, you'd kind of have to dig the bin back up. Uh, but yeah, if you're just looking for a way to get rid of your food waste, this one's perfect. So this is another one of our store-bought tumbling bins, and this one's probably my favorite. It's my favorite because it's made out of metal and it's super sturdy, as well as super easy to turn. So it's got a very nice mechanism for turning, and um, if you're looking for something that's just will last forever, this is probably the one you want. Um, and it's huge, it takes a lot of food waste, so if you have a lot of food waste as well, this is really good for you. So this is another one of our store-bought bins and another one of my favorites. So it goes directly on the ground, easy to set up. It's made of like four or five pieces. They clip very nicely together. Then you just put it on the ground, start filling it up. Um, another good thing about this bin is that because it's on the ground, you can insulate it in the winter by, like I said before, setting hay barrels about, around it or other like carbon sources like that um, to well insulate it. Um, and the last thing that's really nice about this bin is that the bottom uh, down here, you can, um, it, it's got a little door and you can lift up the door and take out the bottom compost because the stuff on the bottom is going to break down first and then you can take the stuff out of the bottom and start using it as, as soon as it starts breaking down. And then you can keep feeding the stuff on top, keep adding food scraps on top. Okay, so another one of our tumbling bins, and this one was um, a lot to set up. It took a while, and um, it involves a lot of screws into the plastic, so that took a while. And if you do end up buying this bin, I would not recommend filling it up to its max capacity, because when we did that, uh, some of the screws broke off. Um, so yeah, still a nice bin, but um, kind of, um, 
can't support all the weight sometimes. So this is another one of our tumbling bins. As you can see, it's a pretty common theme. Uh, tumbling bins are commonly the bins you'll find online. Um, so this one's kind of unique because it has two separate compartments. Uh, so the idea behind that is you start filling up your first compartment and then once you're done filling that up, you go to the second one, you fill that one up completely, and then hopefully when you get back to the first one, all of the food scraps will already be broken down for you, and then you can use the compost product, and so on and so forth. Uh, the only downside to this bin was that it was quite difficult to set up. It was a pretty hard building process, uh, but once you get it built, it works very well. All right, so this is the last bin I'll be talking about right now. Um, as you can see, this was not a store-bought bin. We just built it out of leftover scrap wood, wood pallets, um, and it's just a wooden box. And uh, I basically like showing this one off because I like to tell people that you don't necessarily need to buy a bin. You can make one yourself. Um, so yeah, this one's just made out of wood. You could top it with wood too as well, but we topped it with burlap sacks. Um, anything is fine. Uh, and then we just open it up and let all the compost fall out. Uh, we just have this front door screwed on with two screws, so it's pretty simple to get the compost out of there. So I hope that uh, those explanations helped and maybe got you an idea of what bin you might want to use if you're thinking about composting yourself. Um, does anybody have any thoughts, questions, um, anything? Uh, yeah. Oh, yep. Yeah, there was just a question up at, um, a little further up from Olivia. Can yeah, from Olivia. Uh, so it says, do you put the worms into the ground soil once your compost is done or do you strain them out before planting things in the compost? So you can do both. You can do either. If you don't want to like buy more worms, um, you, you probably want to pick those out, but they're not too expensive. And um, we usually sort through the worms just to keep our compost going, um, but it takes a while. Um, so unless you buy that like, um, that worm factory I was talking about with the different layers, it does take a little while to separate the worms. Um, you could also do like a sifting process with a, um, there's like chicken wire, you could put them on the chicken wire, the compost on the chicken wire, shake it. Most of the time the worms end up on top of the chicken wire and you can, and the dirt falls into the, the wherever the bottom is, if you're putting it in a bucket or whatever, and then pick the worms out like that. Um, so either way, if you want to keep the worms or you can put them in your soil, they're good for soil. So, um, I have a wooden, like the pallet boxes. Do you cover them or is that a preference? Um, you don't need to cover them, but, uh, we usually just cover them with burlap sacks. Um, there's another bin that's, um, I didn't show in the video. Um, that's just covered it with a tarp. We've done that. Um, it's just a preference though. You don't necessarily need to cover it. Um, the covering it though will retain more moisture and more heat as well. So it could insulate it, um, which could be an upside to covering it. Have you done anything with a bioreactor aerating with the PVC pipe with the holes in it? Um, bioreactor, no. Um, we have not done that, but um, the aerated static pile, I didn't show in the video because we're building it tomorrow. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, so I haven't really done that, but the aerating process, usually they say, like everyone tells me that it speeds it up. So I'm excited to get that bin going. Um, can the worms reproduce? They do, they do reproduce. Um, they, there's usually like in the spring, there's a lot of times when they reproduce. Um, I think that's just like the cycle when they do it. Um, yeah, but there, there's actually like little egg things that you'll see. And then the worms come out of these. They're not, I don't know what they are, but they're like, they look like little eggs. Um, yeah, so they definitely do. Um, is there a type of worm you recommend? Yeah, they're called red wigglers. I should have said that. 
Um, red wigglers are usually the best um, type of worm. So I'll type red wigglers. They do have a, oh, I typed it in a private message, sorry. Um, they do have a um, scientific name, but if you type red wigglers and search to buy those, you can buy them online. Um, is there, t yeah, I said that, okay. Um, are animals scavenging a problem when it's not covered? Uh, yeah, it is a little bit of a problem. So I would, rec I do normally recommend covering the piles because um, that can be a problem. Um, but normally, I mean, in the plastic bins, the plastic tumblers, there, I mean, animals can't get in them. So they're not a problem for those type of bins. Cool. Um, I hope I answered everyone's questions and I hope you learned more. Is there any other final questions? Um, if you have more questions, you can email me. I'm fine with emails. Um, I can type my email into the chat if you would like it. I am completely fine with e emails and um, you could also come try it in person. Um, with our volunteer hours um, on Fridays, Gibbs House, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Cool. Oh, I'm glad. I feel, I'm glad you feel more prepared. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for the kind words. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Crystal. That was so well done, so well put together. Um, I hope everyone learned a lot. I know I did. Um, like Crystal said, if you have any questions that weren't answered or if something comes up, please email her. You can also email our office. I'm going to put that email in the chat right now. Okay. Yeah, and like I said, we will be sending um, this workshop out to everyone. So there'll be a recording of this along with the video that I showed towards the end. Um, and then probably some other resources, maybe just like links to different composting bins, um, maybe links to worms. So. Yeah, we will send that out within the coming weeks. And thank you all so much for joining us. Um, are there any last minute questions or comments for Crystal? Oh, and if you liked any of those bins specifically you saw in the video and you email me, I can send you a link to one of those if you want a specific one. Cool. All right, thank you so much. Since it looks like we have no more questions, I'm gonna go ahead and just end the chat. Oops, I put my email in a <laughs> private message too. Okay, let me get that in the message for everyone. Okay, that is our office's email. So I'll just give everyone a second if they need that. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for joining us. And hopefully we'll see you at another workshop in the future or at the Gibbs house or at our open bike shop. So yeah, thank you everyone.